take some time to be in the presence of our Father. As we are reminded in this season of the renewing gift that he gives in the form of his son Jesus being born to us. What an incredible gift that the creator of our world, our universe, loves us enough that he gave us his son to bridge that gap so that we can be in union with him and praise him and worship him and he can be right there with us when we worship. Father, thank you for the gift of your son. void and the same breath that brought the dust to life wanted to be with us mere humans enough to give us his son Jesus amen
of who you are. We can't do it on our own strength, Lord. We can only do it on yours. So fill us with your spirit. Fill us with your love. Fill us with your compassion, your mercy, your grace. And we'll give you the praise, glory, and honor that you deserve. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good morning, good morning. Good morning. Do we have a good Christmas? Yes. How many of you are still sleeping? <laughs> you're here, but you're sleeping. I am. I'm here, but I feel like I'm sleeping, right? Last night I was like, oh man, I got church tomorrow, right? I got to work tomorrow. I got to work. It's, it, I don't know about you, but I kind of felt like it snuck up on y'all. So I was like, oh my gosh, it's Christmas. Wow, and it's church. Okay, good. Yeah. So, um, Think about all the things that you got for Christmas. Like, what did you get for Christmas? You know, that's kind of the question now, the next couple weeks. Especially kids get that question. We ask a lot of kids that question, you know, what did you get? But oftentimes we ask each other, like, oh, what did you get for Christmas, right? What did you get for Christmas? And But my question today that I want us to think about is, what are you, what are you gonna do, right, with what you got? What are you gonna do with the gifts that you got, right? Because we, I don't know about you, the older we get, sometimes you get a gift and you're like, wow, what do I do with it? I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with this. Especially if you're technologically challenged, um, you know, you get something really cool. I got a really cool gift this year uh, because I'm a person that when I drink coffee, in the, I, I make coffee and then um, and I drink a little bit of it and then I let it sit for about an hour so it gets cold. So then I put it in the microwave. So if you ever come to my house, just go look at my microwave. There's probably a cup of coffee that I've left there. Because I constantly heat my coffee up all day. So um, Alyssa got me this, uh, you charge it. Thank God Curtis was there. So they got it good and set up. And so I, I set it down and it heats my, keeps my coffee hot all day. It's the coolest device ever. Right? I have no idea how it works. But it's so cool. And it works. And so I just leave it on the base. I don't know. Maybe I'm not supposed to do that. And it comes with instructions, but I don't know about you, but I've never read instructions. I just <laughs> call Curtis. And so, uh, hey, can you tell me what I'm, what does that light mean? I don't know what that color is. I'm walking around the cup and I go, what's that color mean? Is that bad? Is that a bad color on the cup? I don't know. Right? Again, I don't even know, right? Have you ever seen like an old person get like a, not that anybody in here is old, but, um, right? You, and if, if our, if our, well, I'm not talking about you yet, William, but, uh, no. So, you know, you get the, have you ever seen an old person like with an iPhone 25? I don't even know what the highest number is, but there's probably some iPhone whatever. Yeah. What's the highest? 13, 14, 15, something like that, right? And so, and you're like, what a waste. Because you know they're just they're just using it for a speaker phone, right? Come on, where are my old people? You all answer the phone on speaker, right? I see you in the store. It's like, you know, we can all hear your phone conversation, right? Hi! like wow fabulous great okay right we're answering the phone on speaker and that they've got this wonderful technology in their hands and they use it for a speakerphone and there's so much more they could do with it but they don't know what to do with it right i got this really great gift it cost me a thousand dollars and i use it as a speakerphone 
It's like, get a cricket or what are the, I don't know what those things are called, right? <laughs> but it's, it's amazing. After everything's all cleaned up, you know, we, we sit with our gifts. Some of you aren't even aware of what you got yet, right? Because it's just been so hustle and bustle. And then you're sitting there within the next few days and you're like, okay, let me, let me process what I got. Let me see this. Let me look at it. And then let me really take it in, right? Because there's just, sometimes it, we just get caught up in the busyness of the season that we're not even aware of what we have, what we've been given um, from somebody or whatever. So on Christmas Eve, if you were able to be here, it was very impactful service. Um, and if you didn't, I encourage you to go back. It's on YouTube or Facebook, and you can watch that service. But on Christmas Eve, we were all given a gift um, in this box. No, it's not a truffle. Some were hoping it was. Um, but inside was, the. If, if you open up the box, you'll see, and some of you took yours home, it was actually just the communion elements, the juice and the wafer to remind us of Christ. And we were encouraged to, to we didn't take it together. Uh, everybody could take it home. I had some people that actually took an extra box to give to somebody. That's the greatest gift you could give somebody. Don't get me wrong, an iPhone 25 is awesome. I don't know if they make that. But, um, but the gift of Jesus is... The most incredible gift uh, that you could ever offer to somebody and so a few people did that we actually have some left over so if you missed the service and you wanted to go back online and watch that and take a box Jamie in the back has a basket of those and she will give you one um, but in you know this that's what the gift is but so often we we don't understand the full gift for God so loved us all he gave us his only son, that whoever would receive him, whoever would entrust their life to him, they would never perish, but instead would have this eternal life. And I think so often, much like, you know, the old person with an iPhone, whatever, and using it just for a speakerphone, I think so often we, we take the gift of Jesus Christ and, and we go, sweet, now I get to go to heaven someday. I'm going to put this over here. And I'm not going to lose that because that's my get into heaven free pass. Does not work that way. That's actually not eternal life. Right? Eternal life is not to go to heaven someday. Certainly that's that's the culmination of eternal life. But eternal life, as Jesus says, is to know the one true God and his son, Jesus, whom he sent. Right? That's, that's Jesus' definition of eternal life. And let me tell you something about Jesus. Jesus is always right. That's right. Always right. You think you're always right. Jesus is always right. <laughs> right? And he said, this is eternal life. This is eternal life to know. So think about this. What am I going to do with this, with this gift? This gift of Jesus. What am I going to do with this? It saddens me. Uh, so often because I see so many uh, believers, so many Christians, people who actually believe they are a Christian. And oftentimes, most people, in fact, if you took a poll in America, I don't know what it would be today. I'd have to look it up. But I know within about 10 years ago, I believe the number was about 60%. Six out of 10 people in America call themselves a Christian. What's interesting is when you look at the United States of America, we do not look like a Christian country, right? We don't. Uh, but yet, the majority claim to be a Christian. So it saddens me because I see too many that are Christians that really do not know the value of what they have received in Christ. They truly don't know. It's kind of like, they say they're a Christian because like, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus. Yep, I get it. He died. And, and I'm so grateful and thank you. And, you know, and I, you know, sometimes I go to church and, but, you know, I'm, I'm good. I try to do the best I can, pay my taxes, try not to lie and cheat and steal as often as possible. And, you know, and so I'm good. I'm, I'm a Christian. It's like, well, it's not really the definition of a Christian, right? The, in fact, James tells us that the demons believe in God and they actually fear him. So it's, uh, to say that I'm a Christian because I believe in God, when Jesus says to believe in him, he means entrust your life to them, right? Entrust your life to Christ. But it saddens me because I see too many that don't really know what they have received. And that's a large part 
of the mission of this church. In fact, somebody asked on Christmas Eve night, we had a visitor and she asked, what does the word axis mean? I said, well, it's, it's where everything kind of revolves and centers on this, this one thing. And that one thing is Jesus. To know Jesus, but to then also make Jesus known. Because the rea- you can almost say that our mission is to know Jesus. Because the natural thing that happens when you truly know Jesus, when you truly experience Christ, when you have unwrapped all of what that gift means, guess what? You are on a mission to make sure everybody else knows that. You're compelled to do that. We do that with everything, don't you? You experience a new restaurant, what do you do? You, you phone five friends, right? Um, you you find out that this this new thing works, or or you discover this new technique, or what do we do? If if it's something that we love, we believe in, it's awesome, we share it. We're you know I I tell people all the time, nobody needs to go to a class on how to share about Disneyland. You just you just right you just go to Disneyland and then you just talk about it. Right? Where are my Disneyland freaks? You guys are freaks, by the way. Anyway, but and I got a lot of Disneyland freaks in my life. I'm like. This. You got to come up with something better, but uh, right. It's just like you don't need to take a class on how to share about Mickey Mouse, right? You just do it, right? But yet in church, like we're going to teach you how to share Jesus. No, we're not. (laughs) I'm going to teach you how to get to know Jesus. Sharing Jesus will be easy, right? Because you know Him, so you're going to share Him. You want to share Him, right? It's this natural thing. So the mission of our church. To know Jesus fully and make Jesus fully known. I want to see people. I desperately, and and partly because I spent weeks in prayer for this mission and for this vision, for this church, is because I believe that's the heart of the Father. Jesus did not die simply to give us a get out of hell free card. He died that we would experience because God grieves as a chaplain in the police department I am at the bedside of way too many tragic deaths, right? And, I, and I'm reminding those people that are there that death was never part of God's plan. But we experience death, and we experience sorrow, and we experience pain, and we experience heartache. Some of you, Christmas is not a joyful time. Christmas is a painful time, right? Because of sorrow, because of discord, because of conflict, because of brokenness, because of death. And it grieves God more than it even grieves us. Because it's not what he planned. This is not what he planned. It breaks his heart. So he didn't send Jesus so that someday when we can gimp our way through this thing called life, we will get to go to heaven. He said, no, I brought heaven to you. Right? Isn't it? I think in that song it says that he brought heaven to us so that we can experience eternal life now. So that we are not consumed by death and sorrow and pain and conflict and all the things that are a result of sin in the world, right? So Jesus came, as the song said, to defeat death, which he did. And we don't have to live that. So I want people to know that there's so much more to this gift, right? Just like we need to make that old person know that there's so much more than the speakerphone right, on your device. So there's a story that I've used so often in my ministry, and I use it often because I've never found a better true life story that really, really explains almost a a vivid picture of of what we do in the church. This story has always stuck with me. And it's a story, I have a picture of this guy, I don't know, I think his last name is Norsegian, Rick, so he's actually holding up a, a glass slide. Some of you know this story because I've said it before, and but yet it still just rings so true. So this was, ah, gosh, I want to say it was in 2010. It was a long time ago. And so uh, he actually went to a garage sale and he bought a box of these pit, these glass slides. And he actually, I think, got them for $45 <clears throat> and uh, took them, stored them in his garage, had them for like 10 years or something. So I don't remember when he bought them. And so they were out there and I don't remember exactly what prompts him to um, pull them out and look at them. But he realizes, he comes to discover that this box of slides are actually the originals of Ansel Adams, who's a famous photographer, obviously he's dead. But, um, and so very, if some of you, anybody in Ansel Adams, Fan, beautiful, yeah, they have some beautiful 
pictures and he does he's an amazing photographer so anyways uh, he discovers that they're kind of these hidden I guess there was a fire and they were and they end up in storage and this this guy in fact he actually tried to hunt down the original guy that he bought it from from the garage sale so when he takes him in and he has him appraised when he goes I think these might be the Ansel Adams I look at it it discovers it is Ansel Adams and actually they are worth 200 million dollars yeah can you imagine if right now as you're sitting that somewhere in your house now it's not going to happen in my house because i am the very opposite of a hoarder um there's a hoarder and then there's renee on the other side of the planet i'm the person that if you come to my house i am notorious for this my kids make fun of me it's like mom i haven't even finished my drink it's like are you done 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 <laughs> it's like right and people are like where did where did my food i was drink what happened mom seriously wait until we leave right <laughs> I just, well, you're not using it, clean it up, throw it out, clean it up, throw it out, clean it up. <laughs> I probably would have thrown out $200 million from the slides. Um, so that's never going to happen to me. But some of you in here might be a hoarder. And you may quite possibly, I'm not encouraging you to remain a hoarder, but it's very, can you just imagine if right now in your possession is something that's worth $200 million? Now, would you want to know? Right? <laughs> William's the only one who wouldn't want to know. Because the rest of us want to know. <laughs> yeah. But it, it is absolutely, when I hear this story, I always think about how we have all been given a gift that's worth far more than $200 million. That's right. And, and the sad thing is, it's in storage for most of us. Right. We don't ever access it. And the other sad thing, much like him not knowing about it for 10 years, some of us don't know about it for a very, very long time. That within us is this beautiful, incredible gift, right? I fear that there are too many of us that we're under this illusion that knowing that there is a God and maybe even knowing about Jesus and agreeing with what little you may know is the same as knowing him. But when Jesus says eternal life is to know the one true God and his son, Jesus, that word, when you look it up and understand what did when the disciples heard that or when the original audience heard these words, what did that mean? They would understand it not to mean an intellectual agreement. That's not what that meant. It actually meant to recognize or to experience. So essentially, to know the one true God is to recognize the one true God, right? Thessalonians talks about Paul is telling them because they're thinking that the, the Antichrist is going to come. We all think the anti every president that becomes a president, bless their heart, you're the Antichrist, right? And so, you know, everyone thinks the Antichrist is going to come. And, and so the Bible talks about this Antichrist coming who's going to look like Christ. And the sad thing is the 60% of Americans, I'm not sure of that 60%, <laughs> would be able to recognize. And, and let me let you in on something. Don't try to figure out who the Antichrist is. Know who the Christ is. Amen. Because if you know who the Christ is, don't worry. You will not be deceived by the Antichrist. So stop trying to figure out who the Antichrist is and spend time figuring out who the Christ is. Right? Because then you will know then you will know. So when Jesus says to experience eternal life is to know, he really means to recognize, to experience, right? So do you know what you've been given? Do you know him? Do you know um, what you have? So I, I, I've had this box for years. It usually has some other boxes in it. And so I love to, to put things in this box. I've done this in, in my children's church over the years. Um, but some of us, you know, we've, I want you to imagine that this gift, this box, is really this, I've been given Christ. Think of the moment that you said yes to Jesus, whatever that looks like for you. Maybe you always grew up knowing Jesus because you were raised in the church, but maybe there's a moment in that journey that it really became real for you. You went from kind of knowing to really knowing at some point in your life, at whatever age that was. So that's the moment that it was like, oh my gosh, this is my gift, right? I grew up in the Catholic church. I knew God and Jesus my whole life. Didn't really know him. I just knew him. You know what I mean? And then at 26 years old, it was like, whew, that's mine. 
That's my Jesus, right? I got this gift. So I want you to imagine this is that gift and you've been given it, but much like Rick, do you stick it in a storage, right? Do we, do we put it somewhere else, right? Do we not actually use the gift? It's kind of like, well, I'm going to hang on to it because this is my, this is my gift. No, no, no. Right? Do you know what you have? Do you know what you have? So have you actually used Jesus? Have you actually used the gift God gave you? Because Jesus is so much more than your ticket to heaven, right? So much more. So Isaiah, two scriptures that really help us to understand really who Jesus is. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. When Jesus first starts his ministry, when he first starts his ministry, um, he actually is in his hometown, right? He goes to Nazareth, and he's in the synagogue, um, and there's teaching going on. Um, he stood up to read. Somebody handed him the scroll of Isaiah, which is interesting to note that somebody else handed him the scroll. He did not pick the, the scroll. So they handed him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, and he unrolls it, and he finds the place where it's written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to bind the brokenhearted, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He then basically rolls it up, sits down. Everybody's eyes are fixated on him. There's something about the way that Jesus is saying this. And he says to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And this is a prophet from a thousand years ago. That's, and he's saying that what you've always heard about, it's here, it's now. You've been given this gift. And everything that I just read, right, the, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace, the, the freedom warrior, right, the, the healer, the recovery of sight for the blind, the, to heal the brokenhearted, all of these things. And yet we take this gift and go, whew, I can get into heaven someday. Oh, my gosh. There is so much more. There is so much more. And I wonder how many of you are using the everlasting father, right? Some of you, we need that. I, I, I don't have a father. I mean, technically I have a father. I wouldn't be able to be here without a father. But, I, I, you know, I, I've not spoken to my father since my wedding day, right? 1989, June 10th. So he has no, I have no relationship with my father. I have no idea what it's like to be an adult woman with a father. I, I've never had that, right? But I have this everlasting father in God. What an incredible gift that Jesus gives me is that I get to have this heavenly father that thanks be to God is nothing like my earthly father. He's nothing like my earthly father. He's the very opposite of my earthly father. Some of you have wonderful fathers and that's great. I'm happy for you. But man, when Jesus, part of the gift I got with Jesus was, man, he brought the father to me that God wants me, that God loves me, that God chose me that I belong to him, this everlasting father. Boy, I cling to that sometimes. There are days when I need to know that part of the gift is I can pull out that I have this heavenly father that loves me and accepts me when nobody else does. He does. I belong to him, right? I have this prince of peace because although there's chaos all around me, and sometimes there is, sometimes there is great chaos, but then I'm reminded that, wait a second, Jesus is the one that told the storm to stop, right? And it listened. That Jesus is the God of all peace and reconciliation. There's times where in life when I am in chaos, and boy, too many of us are in chaos. How many of you have realized that you've got this incredible gift stored away in some closet, and guess what? There's this wonderful father that wants to love you. There's this wonderful peacemaker that wants to bring peace in the midst of your chaos, Right? How many of you, when you're going through something, you have no idea what to do, right? And you need a guide. You need a counselor. You need somebody who will walk with you, who will show you. You need an advocate. You have this wonderful counselor that had Christ not come, this counselor would not have come. But he's there to guide us. And so how many of us, there's times in our life where we've got this $2 million gift stored away somewhere, not realizing that there's the answer to so many of our problems, this wonderful counselor, right? And sometimes there's situations that feels like, man, I, I need God's, I need the strength. I need the strength to endure. 
I need the strength to persevere. I need the strength to overcome because I don't know about you, but sometimes it feels like the enemy's winning, doesn't it? Doesn't it seem like wickedness prevails? It seems like wickedness wins, right? If you're a law-abiding good citizen, as soon as you break the law, you're caught, you're convicted, you're going away. But yet criminals seem to do it all the time, get away with it. <laughs> it's like, how is it that wickedness just seems to prevail? Sometimes I need to be reminded there is an almighty God, not a more powerful God, but an all-powerful God. There is a mighty God that in the end has the greatest victory yes. over all evil that's in the world. And sometimes I need to pull that out of the gift and remind myself that I have this mighty, powerful God who, who is for me, who is for us. And then there's times like Jesus said, you know, that I need a physician. Right? I need somebody that will open my eyes and help me to see, as Nick often says, the bigger picture. Open my eyes that I might see. Right? Open the eyes of the, of the blind. Heal the broken hearts and damaged emotions. I am, I, I am so grieved to see so many that are still so hurting and broken from damaged emotions. And there's healing for that. There, and trust me, I am not just speaking in an abstract way. There's a reason that I don't speak to my father, and there's a reason that God healed those damaged emotions, right? I have some things in my past that the Lord was able to heal me, was able to heal that, right? And this great physician, he's a freedom warrior. He fights for our freedom from sin every day. Sometimes that battle is daily, right? I need to be reminded that he redeemed me. I need to be reminded that I am no longer on, under condemnation. How many of us, you know, if you're, if you were raised Catholic, man, that Catholic guilt, right? You're constantly like, oh, geez, I'm going to hell today and heaven tomorrow, right? Oh, geez, hopefully Jesus come back on Wednesday, not Thursday, <laughs> right? It's like, I didn't make it to confession. You know, it's like, oh my gosh, thanks be to God. There's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Yeah. Be grateful for that. Because if he comes back today, some of you are like, I hope he doesn't. Don't worry. <laughs> right? You're like, not today, Jesus. Not today. Right? Tomorrow is a better day. Right? We are set free. There's no condemnation. These, there's so much in this gift that we have been given. There's so much. I actually made about, I think there's 20 of them, these little boxes, just like we did for Christmas Eve. The only difference is there's no bow on it. But inside it is everything I just read to you. And so if you want one for your family just to have, I think it's good to have. It's just somewhere where you just go, I got to remember what I have. <laughs> I need to be reminded of what I actually have. And it's not just I need to pull that out. Don't lose it because I got to take it with me when I get to heaven. Hold on. I put it somewhere, Jesus, right? I, I got my get out of hell free card. I don't know what I did with it, right? No. You have this incredible gift, and much like Rick, please do not store it up somewhere and not realize that you have this treasure. As Paul talks about, we have this treasure in jars of clay, right? We have, it's, I imagine Rick, I can't, he's probably a hoarder, right? And it was probably in his garage, all buried somewhere, right? And didn't even know it. And some of us, right, we got this jar of clay. And it means it's going to pass away. It's going to fall to pieces, right? Some of you are like, I know, I'm old. It's going to, right? And so, but there's this treasure that we have that we forget about that's there in us, right? There's a powerful, um, and if anybody wants one of these, by the way, Jamie has those as well in the back. Um, that will have all of those little papers in them for you. You're more than welcome to take them, take the communion ones. I always think it's great to have a visual reminder because we are a forgetful people. This is why Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. He knew we'd all be always be eating, right? He's like, they're a bunch of fatties. They'll be eating all the time. Give them bread and wine. Tell them every time they have bread and wine, they'll be doing that a lot, right? <laughs> it's like, right? Only fat people in the room get that. But anyway, so... Like, heck yeah, Bodine's here I come after church. But Jesus says, whenever you're doing that, think about me. Remember me. Well, he told us that because he knew we'd forget. Nobody says, doesn't remind you to remember if they don't realize that you forget all the time. Right? Jesus, God knew you're going to forget. God, from the beginning of time, have been setting things in motion to remind you. Because he knows 
that in this world we're distracted. Right? We're all distracted. Squirrel, there it goes. We're off on something else. We completely forgot. Right? Where's my people in the room? As you go upstairs to get something, and 20 minutes later you come back down and you're like, dang it! I gotta get a single story. Right? Gotta go all the way back up there. Or who's with me on this? Have you ever walked into a room and you're like, I have no idea why I'm here. <laughs> here I am in the room. I literally have to go back down, do what I was doing. There it is. Okay, now I'm back. This is the worst memory on the planet. Gold. Gold. Yeah. See, I don't even know what that. I, I was, Peter and I were talking about that. I couldn't even remember the animal. It's a goldfish. It's not an elephant. It's the opposite of an elephant. How is it that I can remember that elephant, and elephant's one that actually remembers things? That's really weird. But Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me because he knew we would forget. So I give you these things because these are great things to remind you that you have an everlasting father. You have a wonderful counselor. You have a powerful God that is for you and not against you. Right? You, you have this prince of peace that wants to bring peace into our chaos. There's a counselor, there's a Holy Spirit that has been given to you when you accepted this gift that took residence in your life and for some of us is dormant and we need to bring back alive. Who wants to speak life into you, who wants to remind you what Christ said, wants to remind you of what Christ did, wants to correct you when you're wrong, wants to lead you on paths of righteousness. These are all the things that we get in this gift. There's a powerful, almost frightening account of a rich man who knew God yet perished and ended up in torment. There's actually another scripture that uh, can be actually frightening to read, and we, don't, we, we rarely hear about this story and these stories because they don't, they don't feel good, right? They don't feel good. Um, and the reality is he perishes not because he's rich, but it's because he did not know the one true God. He did not realize who God actually was to him and for him. He was actually quite wealthy. So I'll read the story to you uh, here. It says, this poor man... Uh, well, let's read the story here. There was a rich man, um, and and just so you know, uh, majority of Bible commentaries believe this is an actual account. It's not a parable, because the the poor man is named, which in no parable is anybody named. They believe that Jesus um, is actually recounting something from an eternal perspective. So Jesus is telling the story. There's a rich man who is dressed in purple and fine linen, lived in luxury every day. At the gate uh, was laid a beggar named Lazarus. He was covered with sores and longing to eat what was left uh, from the man's table. Even the dog came and licked his sores. Just so you know, wealthy people, this is crazy. Wealthy people um, back then, uh, how they used to uh, dry and uh, kind of clean their hands off was with bread. So they would take bread and do this. And so the crumbs, the beggars would hope to get some of those, as would the animals. So the, and it's also interesting to note that this rich man has a beggar living at his gate. So um, I don't know if you're familiar in Stockton. We have a few homeless people. And um, if you notice, there's some that will, they are positioned in very strategic places. And you know why? Because they know that's where they can get something, right? Have you ever seen where there's one that's kind of consistent in one area? Because like, that's my spot. This is, it works for me. People are generous here, whatever. So it's interesting to think that this, um, that this poor man was at his gate, which tells us that I think that the rich man did kind of throw him some scraps here and there. But what's interesting is he has this mansion and he has actually an exorbitant amount of money. He's not just wealthy, he's actually quite wealthy because it says he lived in luxury every day. Again, go back to what people heard when it was read in that time. It was read in that time if they heard that, people that, that ate and feasted uh, would do that occasionally, but they wouldn't do it every day. This man did it every day. So he was ridiculously uh, wealthy. So the time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried in Hades, which you would think of as hell. And it's not actually the final place of torment. Um, really, everybody goes to Hades. It's just kind of, the, it's like the holding cell. Um, but um, some are in torment and some are in paradise, like the, the man on the cross he would have entered into a state of paradise, a state of bliss. Although until Christ comes back and everything is, it's a whole other lesson on hell. But he's buried in Hades where he was in torment. He looked up and he saw Abraham far away and he sees Lazarus by his side. Let's go to the next slide. 
So he called to him, this is really important, Father Abraham. So now we know that this man who died was a descendant of Abraham. We know that he probably went to temple. I guarantee you the rich man thought he was a believer because he knew God, because he was a descendant of Abraham. Yet, that did not get him into heaven. He said, have pity on me and send Lazarus. Interesting to note that he still is asking Lazarus to serve him. To dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this fire. But Abraham replies to him, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things. That's what you worked for. Whatever you're working for, that's what you get. Don't be upset in the end of that's what you end up with. While Lazarus received bad things. But now he's comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all of this, between us and you as a great chasm has been um, set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. Next slide. He answered, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let them warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. See what happens? Nobody needed to train him to go and tell. When you know who Christ is, when you understand heaven and hell, it's like when people jokingly say, I'm going to go to hell. I say, you don't believe that. You don't believe that. You would never say that. But see, even in this state, he's like, send them, right? Right? So that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the, and the prophets. Um, let them listen to them. <laughs> no, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. Do you understand the irony in this statement? Because somebody did come from the dead, didn't he? His name is Jesus. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, and that statement to us would be, if you will not listen to the word of God, then you will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. This poor man, ironically, believed he had all he needed and wanted, only to find out he missed out on all that the poor, wretched man at his gate had, and that he at the gate was truly the wealthy one. He didn't realize. He didn't realize. And I don't know, you know, it's like the church of Laodicea. We're, we're fine. And Jesus says, no, you're not. No, we have everything we need. No, you don't. You don't have me. Right? You don't have me. For God so loves you, God so loved us, that he gave us himself, the greatest gift. He gave us a perfect father. He gave us a wonderful advocate, a wonderful counselor. He gave us a peacemaker. He gave us access to all of his power and might. He gave us freedom from all that tries to bind us and keep us down. He gave us new sight to see and experience all that he offers. We can now fix our eyes on what is unseen. So my question for you this morning is, do you know him? Do you really know him? When you think about all your gifts, when you're opening your gifts, maybe like I said on Christmas Eve, take the box. Take the box with all the things. And as you're trying to figure out all your new toys and your new devices and all the things that you got, um, remember that you have this incredible gift it's the most valuable gift in your house, and it's actually within you. I hope it's within you. If it's within you, I hope that you begin to unpack it. I hope that this new year you actually try to discover who Jesus actually is. God is for you. God is for you. I pray that you would find him. I pray that you would seek him and that you would love him. Let me pray for you, Father. Lord, we are in awe of the value of everything that you give us, Lord. We can't even begin to truly fathom all there is to unpack in this gift of Jesus Christ. Forgive us, Lord, because much like all of our little devices, we just use one little feature on it and don't realize all the different things there are. God, you did not send your son Jesus just so we could go to heaven someday. You sent your Jesus to us, Lord, so that we could be with you today. 
Lord Jesus said that he, that he goes to prepare a place for us so that he could take us to be with him where he is. His prayer is that we would be one with you as he is with you in the spirit. And Lord, I pray, God, that you would help each and every one of us that know Jesus, that maybe have spent our whole life knowing him, that we would come to recognize him, that we would come to experience all there is to experience in this wonderful gift. Lord, this everlasting Father, this Prince of Peace, this wonderful Counselor, this mighty God, this freedom warrior, this great physician, the one who, who binds the brokenhearted, who heals our wounds, even the deep wounds that we're not even aware of. Lord, forgive us, Lord, that we look to so many other things instead of the incredible value we have is within our grasp. It's within us. Now help us to discover it, Lord, and to know you more and more. We pray this in your name. Amen.
It's more than I can say And I melt in your peace It's overwhelming to me this final week of the year let God lead you through the closing of this chapter and may you be focused on him as you start 2022 may the Lord bless you may the Lord keep you may he make his face shine upon you give you strength give you peace go in peace